This episode has been brought to you by DiceyGoblin.com, online board game retailer, where every board game is an award-winning board game. Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline, bringing you the rules video for Pandemic Legacy today. Now, these rules are going to primarily be the rules that are different for Legacy versus regular Pandemic. I'm not going to give you a full run through on how to play the general Pandemic rules. There's lots of videos online already for that, so go check those out. This one's going to be specific to the Pandemic Legacy differences, with a few exceptions, like in the setup and stuff like that. But you'll see that as you watch the video. So, without anything else, let's get right into it. So the first thing that you got to think about is what is a permanent change and what gets reset. And it basically breaks down like this. Any sort of writing you do, any uh, stickers you put on the board, such as these, or stickers you put on a card, such as uh, this unfunded event right here, um, and possibly destroying components, such as tearing up cards like this. All of that is going to be a permanent change. In all other ways, the game resets for the start of each game. The pieces on the board, the cards in your hand, the outbreaks, all of that will start fresh. Pandemic Legacy is broken down into 12 months, starting in January, ending in December. If your group succeeds in their first play of a month, then you will uh, move on to the next, to the next month. Uh, if instead you fail, you get one more chance. So you can see, for instance, in February, in our first play, we failed. And so we played a second time in February. You start a new game with the current set of rules and objectives for that month. Um, if you lose again, if you lose a second time, then you must move on to the next month for your next game. All right, this is the Legacy deck. Now, you can see we've obviously been going through it a bit. So this particular card... Um, it's, this says stop, so we've been drawing, we stop here, and draw this card just before you set up your first game in May. Now the Legacy de deck contains cards that will describe what happens over the course of the 12 months of the game. It's arranged in a specific order, you do not look at or shuffle the cards in any way until you're told to look at that card, but you definitely don't shuffle the cards. At the start of a game, you'll draw the cards and read them one at a time until you get to a card that says stop, like this one. This card will tell you when to continue drawing from the deck, which might be mid-game, uh, it might be at the end of the game, or at the start of the next month. The Legacy deck is a, a one-way trip. Even if you repeat a month, do not put cards back in the Legacy deck. This is the reminder token. And basically, it's used to remind players of certain things throughout the game. So I'm not going to give any examples of what those things are because that would be a spoiler. However, just keep in mind that when the game references the reminder token, this is what it's talking about. In the box, you get a stack of five top secret dossiers. These contain the stickers that will go onto the game and into the rule book. As you go through the Legacy deck, you'll come across cards that have dossier numbers or letters written on them. I'm not going to show you any just because I don't want to accidentally show you some of the other you know, wording that's on the cards that might be give away some spoilers. But just know they're basically circles with numbers and letters in them. And these reference, what these numbers and letters reference are uh, these top secret dossier um uh, there's like doors inside of them. So when you open up the dossier doors matching any of the numbers and letters, you'll do, it, do so one at a time and resolve each one before you open the next. And I will go to show you one of these. So you can see here, this is what it looks like. It's got some letters down here and then numbers. The letters generally are going to be rules that and what the letters reference are specific places in the rule book that you're going to fill in. Uh, if you watched the unboxing that I did, you saw there are lots of blank spots in the rule book. In fact, let me show you. I can show you a blank spot still without spoiling anything, I believe. You'll see, yeah, no stickers on this page yet. So right here are some blank spots, and that's where these rules would go. Some doors in these uh, dossiers will contain one-time stickers and others will create a card that will be used from time to time in the future. 
These are the eight packages that come in the game. As you play through the game, uh, yellow boxes will instruct you to open specific packages. Before your first game, place this yellow open package eight sticker next to or onto the door of package eight. And basically it's just telling you if you lose four games in a row, you can see right there, if you lose four games in a row, then you get to open that package. So either they're going to really punish you bad for losing those four, or hopefully there's some help in there, because at that point you need it, obviously. All right, now these spaces up here are the objective spaces. There are actually five objective spaces. I can't show you all these over here because there's some um, over here on this side because there's some stickers on the board that you can't see right now. At the beginning of each game, you'll have an objective or objectives, obviously since there's five spaces, that you need to complete. The number needed will be shown on the board. So here in January, you see these one star, you need to complete one objective. Whereas in March, there's two stars, you're gonna have two objectives. If an objective is mandatory, then you must complete it. Um, you do not need to, so there's, there'll be mandatory objectives and then also uh, perhaps some non-mandatory objectives. If you have multiple non-mandatory objectives, you do not need to decide which you're going to complete prior to playing. Wait and see how the game unfolds and then just complete whichever one ends up being easier based on what's going on in the game. Some objectives will remain until the group completes them. Others will expire at the end of a particular month. As the year unfolds, new objectives will be introduced and you know all that will become clearer as you play the game. At the beginning of the game, uh, you choose four funded events because you start with a funding level of four. If you lose a game, your funding level will go up by two because the governments of the world decide that you obviously need some help. If you win a game, your funding level goes down because by two. Your funding level goes down by two if you win because the governments of the world decide, well, hey, you've got this in hand. We don't need to be spending quite so much money. We put that into whatever, roads or something. There's a minimum funding level of zero and a maximum of ten. And when it, so like if you have a funding level of four, then you see this says funded event. Now I'm only showing you this one because I honestly can't remember which ones the, the game started with and I don't want to spoil anything as far as what other ones might be in the game. But with this one, uh, you would take a funded event equal to your funding level. So if your funding level is four, you choose which four you want in the player deck and shuffle them in during your setup. So I showed you this earlier, this is the game calendar. You're gonna use this to record your progress. You can see game one starts with four funding. It's got the actual date that we played it on and then whether you wanna lose and the names of the, uh, cause you, you create characters in the game and give them names. And so the names of the characters that were used in the game. And as you go along, if you win the first month, you move to the next and, and so on and so forth. And the most important part of this probably is keeping track of your funding level so you remember where you're at as far as that goes. Now there are six regions in the game. For this video, I'm just going to show you how to distinguish what the regions are. They're not the continents. So here, while North America is a region, the way you tell what the regions are is with this line right here. So you have North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Rim. And again, I can't really show you uh, the other areas too much because of some of the stuff that's on the board already. Down here is the disease tracking area and you'll use this area to keep track of any changes that occur to the disease. If you eradicate a disease, you actually write the disease's name here and uh, perhaps uh, positive mutations would be something that you keep track in this area. You can also see at the bottom, that's where you put the cures when you find them. Whenever an outbreak occurs in a city, its panic level goes up by one. And the way this works is obviously the outbreak is gonna move, the outbreak marker is gonna move one. And let's say it was San Francisco. You do all the normal stuff you do for an outbreak. Obviously the disease cubes are gonna to spread to all the neighboring cities. But the other thing that will occur is that you'll take the next number from this sticker sheet, in this case, the one, because San Francisco doesn't have any panic yet. This is the, the box that keeps track of that. And you'll place the one on it right here. Uh, let's say it was Los Angeles instead. Well, in that case, Los Angeles would take a two and you'd put it on 
Los Angeles. Now up here, you can see the effects of the panic. Level one, the city's unstable, no effect. Two through three, rioting. No direct flights or charter flights in or out of the city. Existing research stations are destroyed. No new research stations can be built there. And it gets worse and worse as you go along. These effects are cumulative. And they just because you move on to the next one doesn't mean the previous effects go away. If your character is in a city and it reaches level five, fallen, that character is lost. Each player begins game one by creating their character. To create a character, you're gonna choose which character card you're gonna use, and I've chosen one that we haven't used yet during the game. Um, so that way you don't have any sort of, any information whatsoever about what goes on. And you're gonna give that character a name right here, where it says character name. Now that right there is all it takes to create a character. These characters will carry on through the game, going from game to game, and you do not have to use the same ones in each game. Uh, the game starts with five characters, so as you go along, you can decide to create another character at the beginning of the next game, uh, and just keep in mind that when the game references creating a character, that's all it's talking about. Pick one that has not been used and give it a name. Now, characters may become mentally or physically damaged through the course of play. If a character is in a city when it outbreaks, they become scarred. You can see right here, scar one, scar two. There's two spots for a scar on the dispatcher. If a character needs another scar, but there is no room on their card, so in this case needs three scars, then they become lost. And you can see you find the scars here on the main sticker sheet that comes with the game in this area right here. We've only used one, thankfully, so far off of this sheet, so uh, we're doing pretty good as far as that goes. Now, at this point, you've heard me refer to a lost character several times. If your character becomes lost, you literally will take your character card and rip it up and throw it away. It can never be used again. Discard all cards that you have in your hand and take a civilian card matching the color of your pawn. That's what a civilian card looks like. And you can see you have no special abilities, upgrades or relationships. If you get a scar, instead of adding one to this card, discard your hand. Put your pawn in a research station and retain any remaining actions that you had. All right, so you're gonna take, after this one is, is lost, you'll take a civilian matching the color of your pawn, you'll place your pawn in a research station, any research station on the board. If you don't have any research stations because things have gone completely and terribly wrong, you'll place your pawn in Atlanta. If your character became lost during your turn, and you have more actions, or, or your turn is just not complete, finish your turn. All right, let's run through the setup real quick. First, you'll read your mission briefing, which will be found inside the legacy deck. Then you're gonna set out the board, all the pieces, including the disease cubes and the research stations. The outbreak marker goes on zero. The infection rate marker will start up here at the front of the infection rate chart and all of your cure markers start at the bottom of the board and as i've said before any objectives that you might have will go up here at the top of the board you'll infect nine cities just like you do in regular pandemic by flipping over a card and putting three cubes for the first three two for the next three and one for the next three you'll then select the characters you're going to use and choose your starting location. Now, in your first game, your starting location is going to be Atlanta because that's the only place that has a research station. However, as a game end upgrade, you are able to place permanent research stations elsewhere on the board. If you have more than one permanent research station, you choose which location you're gonna start at and all players must start at that location. At this point, you have completed the setup and so this is where you would use any sort of game winning bonus that you would have gotten from winning a previous round if you have it and after you use that bonus then you begin the game now as i said before panic level is going to increase due to outbreaks however if the game would end due to outbreaks you only increase the panic level for the first eight outbreaks so for instance let's say here let's say chicago ends up outbreaking okay so you're obviously going to 
Blue Cube on Montreal, place one on San Francisco, one on Los Angeles, and one on Mexico City. Atlanta's going to outbreak as well. So we already had one for Chicago, and now Atlanta has an outbreak. All right, so that's the game-ending outbreak right there. That means that even though Washington technically would have a chain reaction outbreak from Atlanta, you don't have to increase the panic level for Washington as well. You will only increase it for the first two. If it's a situation where you have simultaneous outbreaks that end the game, you actually get to choose which one you'd prefer have the panic level increase. If the panic level reaches two for a city with a research station, what you're going to do is you're going to destroy that research station. So let's say Atlanta's reached level two. And then you would actually place on that research station on the board one of these destroyed research station stickers to let you know that you cannot start one there anymore. If you have a city that's already at level five, the city's already fallen, then the outbreak occurs as usual, but you don't have any other stickers to place on it. You just do the outbreak. In future games, it is possible for cities to become isolated. This is straight from the rulebook. This is not a spoiler. The rulebook tells you this. So outbreaks do not affect adjacent cities if they are isolated. Uh, in this case, you would still increase the panic level in the city, but you do not raise the outbra outbreak track marker, and it does not spread into adjacent cities. Now, if you win the game, you get the win bonus for the month. I obviously can't show you those because that'd be spoilers. You start the next game in the next month. Your funding level is cut by two to a minimum of zero. And then you need to record your game on the game calendar on the back of the book. If you lose, then if this is your first game of a month, you'll play the month again. However, if this is your second game in that month, you move on to the following month, which means you're moving on without your game winning bonus because you did not win the previous month. Your funding level is increased by two to a maximum of 10. And again, you record your game on the game calendar. In either case, win or lose, you'll choose two upgrades. You'll clear the board of all game pieces you discard all city cards and then reset for your next game. Do not put any legacy cards back in the legacy deck whether or not you win the game. If playing the same month again, your mission briefing and objectives are the same. Basically anything that comes out of the legacy deck stays out and, and you play it as if they were there from the beginning. And finally, let's talk about game end upgrades. Now, win or lose, you're going to choose two. And what these game end upgrades are, you've got starting research stations, you have unfunded events, character upgrades, and positive mutations. With an unfunded event, which are these right here, you're going to select an event sticker and add it to any city card in the player deck. This card can then be used as either a city card as normal or an event card, but it cannot be used as both. So you can't discard it and get both effects. These are unaffected by the funding level and you get one sticker per city card. So you can't be doubling up on, on a single city. The starting research stations, select a city that currently has a research station in it at the end of your most recent game. Add a starting research station sticker near that city. When you set up the game from now on, a research station will start there. Do not place it inside the panic level box, just place it near the city, similar to how Atlanta is already set up. With character upgrades, which you'll find right here, add an upgrade to a character. If you run out of room, you can cover up previous upgrades. You can only upgrade characters used in the current game. So you can know upgrading characters that are still in the box to make them more useful later. It has to be characters that you used this time. And finally, with the positive mutations, which are found right here, if you eradicate a disease during this game, you may give that disease a positive mutation. You put the sticker into the tracking area. Uh, the efficient sequence or efficient to sequence mutation that you'll find on here may occur on any player's turn. Also, Let's look at that a little bit closer. 
It says, as a game in upgrade, you may add a pause mutation sticker to disease you eradicated during your just played game. Pause mutations must be added in order. So it doesn't say it in the rule book, but it does say it right here. So you must place one before you can place two, and, and so on and so forth. And that efficient sequence they were talking about that can be used on any player's turn, you no longer need to spend an action to discover a cure for this disease. So as soon as a player has that ability, they can play it. And, and you'll see that the, the one before that, common structure you no longer need to be in a research station to discover a cure for this disease so basically once you combine those two and then no matter where you are you can discover the cure for that particular disease so there you have it all the rules for pandemic legacy that you need to know to start your first game uh, i hope you enjoyed the video i hope you enjoy this game it really is an experience uh, we were five games into it so far and and it's just been an absolute blast playing it so if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like my channel, please subscribe. You can find me on Board Game Blender about every other week. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.